Greetings and welcome back to the channel. And today we'll continue to dive into the world of science fiction cinema of the 1930s. 1932 was not a banner year for sci-fi. In fact, three of the four films I'll discuss are rather obscure, and all four are closer to a mix of styles with science fiction aspects rather than traditional examples of the genre. They flirt with science fiction rather than embrace it head on. And so I see 1932 as a year to explore and wonder what could have been. The ideas of each of these films are intriguing. This was an experimental year for science fiction as it mixed with adventure, mystery, romance, and spy thrillers with less than memorable results. Which is man's greatest love? His love of life, his love of friend, his love of country, or his love of woman? Which will he choose with only six hours to live? This is the tagline from the print ad in the Freelance Star, About Six Hours to Live, an American film from director William Dieterle. Starring Warner Baxter, Miriam Jordan, and John Bowles, this mostly forgotten film was based on the story Auf Wiedersehen, by Gordon Morris and Morton Bartow. The plot revolves around a scientist who invents a device that can bring an organic being back to life, but only for six hours, leading to a series of moral dilemmas after it is used to revive murdered diplomat Paul Onslow. Following his resurrection, Paul must grapple with the knowledge of his impending fate. Before his murder, he was an ambassador to a small mythical country. He was killed so that he could not vote on a trade agreement that would have averted a war that the other diplomats so desperately wanted. This premise is reminiscent of the League of Nations' failed attempts at world disarmament to avert future wars. Many were already fearing the Germans rebuilding its military but the League of Nations did little to actually stop the tides of war. Paul is given a second but brief chance and must choose between spending his final hours with the woman he loves, doing his duty for his country, or avenging his own murder. The scientist who created the device is elated his experiment worked. The police detective wants to know the name of Paul's killer, and Paul himself wants to use his last few hours to tie up loose ends, but winds up going on a side quest to give his money away to a mother grieving the loss of her child. In the end, Paul makes sure he is the last of his kind by destroying the machine that gives him this final opportunity to set things right. The science fiction elements have few moments in the spotlight, especially the resurrection chamber. The set design and cinematography, along with the visual effects as Paul is awakened, are the most visually interesting part of the film. Reviews are mostly positive, though I wish the film would have done more with the Frankenstein-like premise. From the New York Times, they said, Fantastic as the theme of Six Hours to Live, William Dieterle's gift of direction, and the capable performances of the principals, cause it to be an unusually compelling piece of work. It may disappoint those who look for a final flash of the hero and heroine in each other's arms, but it will please others who want imagination and subtlety in screen entertainment. I'm not a huge fan of this film. This would have been an intriguing sci-fi murder mystery, but it went for romance and melodrama instead. And when Paul does confront his killer... It's quite anticlimactic and almost an afterthought in the story. The film didn't seem to know what genre it wanted to fit into. Six Hours to Live is available to watch for free on YouTube if you would like to check out this obscure, genre-blending film. Before continuing with the films of 1932, if you are enjoying the content, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content. Your support is what keeps this channel thriving, and I'm thankful for everyone stopping by, 
and sharing the love for this amazing genre. Though it's not exactly a science fiction film, I do want to briefly discuss Shandu the Magician, an American pre-code adventure film that uses the sci-fi concept of a death ray as a MacGuffin to set the story into motion. The use of a MacGuffin, a plot device or object that drives the narrative and motivates characters, often with its specific nature being less important than its function to move the story forward, would become popular in the 1940s and even into filmmaking today. This fun adventure was based on the popular radio series and starred Edmund Lowe as Shandu, Bella Lugosi as the villainous Roxor, and Irene Ware as Princess Naji. Yes, the white woman is playing an Egyptian princess, something that would be heavily criticized today. The radio series would continue until 1950, and Lugosi was far more charismatic than our leading man, and Fox must have agreed because, in 1934, Lugosi took over the role as Shandu in the 12-part serial, The Return of Shandu. The New York Times called the film whopping entertainment for the children and a series of naively juvenile escapades for the grown-ups. Directed by William Cameron Menzies and Marcel Varnell, it follows the adventures of Frank Chandler, also known as Shandu, a stage magician and hypnotist with real mystical powers. When the evil Roxor kidnaps Shandu's brother-in-law and plots to conquer the world using a death ray, Shandu embarks on a perilous journey to thwart Roxar's plans. Using his magical abilities, Shandu faces various supernatural challenges as he attempts to rescue his family and save the world from the forces of darkness. Shandu is a strange mix of genres, but a good time nonetheless. Combining elements from popular genres at the time, from the mad scientist to spies to romance with a princess, to our dashing hero who saves the day. But looking at it today, you can clearly see problems with the mostly all-white casting. The production design and cinematography were very good for a limited budget and were the true stars of the film. The death ray aspects should have been highlighted more, and we only get into those sci-fi aspects late in the film as the villain activates the machine and then is stopped by our heroes. But what is worth mentioning most about this film is that Shandu would go on to inspire later comic book characters, such as Marvel's Doctor Strange. Shandu the Magician and the Return of Shandu are available to watch for free on YouTube. FP1 Antwortet Nicht, or in English, FP1 Doesn't Answer, is an obscure German film from UFA Productions and directed by Karl Hartel. UFA was the famed German production company behind the films Dr. Mabuza the Gambler, Metropolis, and Woman in the Moon. Three versions of this now obscure film were made with separate cast in three different languages, German, French, and English, to take advantage of the sound phenomenon for international audiences. This was a way for European films to compete with English language talkies, but the practice was costly and didn't last long into the sound era. Set in the near future, the story revolves around the construction and defense of a floating platform in the Atlantic Ocean, designed to speed up transatlantic air travel. As various international interests clash over control of FP1, The film tries to explore themes of technological progress, global politics, and the challenges posed by the changing nature of transportation. In the end, the film glosses over these themes to deal with a love triangle that, in my opinion, works better in the English than the German version. The German version has a runtime of almost two hours, while the English version, cutting most of the fat, is about 70 minutes. The plots for both are similar, however. The English version cuts more to the chase, and I thought most of the actors were an improvement on the original, with the exception of the journalist who was played by Peter Lorre in the German version, making the most of his small role. This was the last German film he would make before fleeing the rise of the Nazi party, and 
Bond would find fame in the United States with The Man Who Knew Too Much, Casablanca, and The Maltese Falcon. Variety called the German version UFA's Greatest Picture of the Year and a success with regard to speed, continuity, and cast of the leading female. I disagree with Variety. I prefer Leslie Fenton as Claire in the English version, rather than Sybil Schmitz. Fenton had more charisma with the two leading men. Critics had far more praise for the cinematography, set, and sound design. The use of miniatures for the platform and planes were impressive, but that's not enough to save a bland romance story. After watching both the German and English versions, I found that neither took full advantage of the futuristic aspects of a floating platform or the mystery surrounding the sabotage. The use of the futuristic elements were so grounded, it seemed quite realistic rather than fantastical. The German version with English subtitles is available on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. And the English version is available on DVD, as well as for rent in the United States. Island of Lost Souls is an American science fiction horror hybrid directed by Earl C. Kenton. Paramount was hoping to cash in on the monster craze, taking over Hollywood at the time. Made before the production code was strictly enforced, Kenton took advantage and turned up the horror and sexuality. Loosely based on H.G. Wells' novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau, the film follows the story of Edward Parker. Parker, played by Richard Arlen, is stranded on an island owned by the mysterious Dr. Moreau, played by the scene stealer Charles Lawton. The doctor wants to run an experiment by introducing the human Parker to the beautiful Lota, played by Kathleen Burke, who won the role in a contest promoted by Paramount for fans to find the Panther Girl. Parker assumes she is just a woman sheltered on this horrific island, but she is one of the many experiments. Moreau is hoping Lota and Parker will have sex and conceive a hybrid child. As Parker uncovers the doctor's dark experiments to transform animals into human-like creatures, the film delves into themes of morality, ethics, and the consequences of tampering with nature. With what I have discovered in my own work among the cellular organisms, my work, my discoveries, I am With these, I have wiped out hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. The film faced censorship issues due to its controversial themes, especially the depiction of vivisection, which refers to the practice of conducting surgical procedures or experiments on living animals for scientific research, typically involving the dissection or manipulation of tissues and organs. Isn't human. Crimes are human. You know what it is when I began with? No. An animal. An animal. Mm -hmm. Like those in the cages outside? Mr. Bucker, do you know what it means to feel like God? The makeup and visual effects stand out. Wally Westmore, who created the makeup effects for 1931's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, brought the eerie and otherworldly Beastmen characters to life. Island of Lost Souls had a mixed reception upon its release in 1932. While it gained recognition for its atmospheric tension, makeup effects, and Charles Lawton's performance as Dr. Moreau, the film also faced controversy due to its disturbing and provocative content. Reviews range from It Out Frankenstein's Frankenstein from The Hollywood Filmograph to Horrible to the Point of Repugnance from the LA Times. Though Variety thought the film was a cheap adventure, I found that the production design, makeup, and cinematography deserve all the praise. H.G. Wells, on the other hand, was not as thrilled. He was dissatisfied with the final product. He wrote about his views in Screenland magazine in 1935, calling the film terrible and handled miserably but he did like Lawton as Dr. Moreau. Wells hated the horror aspects of the film, stating, quote, No subtlety was used in the creation of this dreadful atmosphere. 
The whole thing was so ridiculously obvious that I must repeat, it was miserable, unquote. This was not the first time Wells was unhappy with a film adaptation of The Island of Dr. Moreau. I covered the 1921 film adaptation, Island of the Lost, in episode 4. The German adaptation was a poorly mishandled and misguided adventure story that Wells claimed he had no prior knowledge of until years afterward and didn't give his permission for the production. Island of Lost Souls would go on to influence future sci-fi and horror films with its exploration of ethical dilemmas, of Dr. Moreau's experiments, and the boundaries of how far science should go, as well as what it means to be human and who gets to make those decisions. There are always societal fears about scientific advancements and the ethical choices made for the betterment of society. These fears will never end if science continues to evolve at an exponential rate. It is in this fear of the unknown that we find the most intriguing character. You broke the law. Law no more. The Sayer of the Laws, played by Bella Lugosi, who struggles with his search for identity and speaks to many of us who want to be a part of the world while being held back because we just don't fit in. You spill blood. He tell me spill blood. What is the law? Law no more. Wells' novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau, would be adapted numerous times with Terror is a Man from 1959, The Island of Dr. Moreau in 1977 with Burt Lancaster and Michael York, and a 1996 version with Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer. What is the law? Not to spill blood. He tell me spill blood. What is the law? Law no more. The film was banned or scenes were cut in several countries due to its controversial nature. An uncut restored version was released by the Criterion Collection in 2011. Island of Lost Souls can be watched for free on the Internet Archive, and I'll link it in the description below. In 1932, the science fiction literary landscape was vibrant and dynamic. The pulp magazine era, encompassing publications like Amazing Stories, Astounding Stories, and Wonder Stories, provided the ideal platform for the genre's flourishing. Esteemed authors, including E.E. E. Doc Smith, Philip Wiley, and John W. Campbell Jr., made significant contributions delving into themes such as space exploration, futuristic technology, and the societal ramifications of scientific advancements. Even if sci-fi films of this time were not as plentiful, 1932 marked a pivotal and dynamic period in sci-fi literature. Not only did these contributions shape the landscape of science fiction, they also acted as catalysts for future filmmakers and storytellers, serving as direct inspirations or as ideas for subsequent sci-fi adventures. Published in 1932, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World emerged as a groundbreaking work that foresaw the perils of unchecked technology and societal progress. This dystopian narrative delved into themes of mass production, genetic engineering, and the erosion of individual freedoms, offering a prescient commentary on the dehumanizing effects of a future shaped by authoritarianism. Despite its literary significance, the book faced bans in various parts of the world, underscoring the controversial nature of its critiques. In the aftermath of World War II and witnessing the rise of figures like Hitler, Huxley's insights gain renewed relevance. In 1958, Huxley published Brave New World Revisited, a nonfiction work that critically analyzed societal trends, reflecting on how the world was inching closer to the unsettling vision portrayed in his original novel. He looked at the world from the novel's publication in 1932, through World War II and Hitler, as well as reflecting on George Orwell's 1984, which was published 
in 1949. Huxley wrote how fiction was becoming fact. Over the years, the enduring impact of Brave New World has been evident through various adaptations, including theatrical productions, radio broadcast, and television series in 1980, 1998, and 2020, attesting to its enduring relevance in exploring the ethical implications of advancing technology and societal control. In 1932, the world grappled with the Great Depression, political shifts, and cultural transformations with key events such as the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. These historical developments not only shaped the course of the 20th century, but also laid the groundwork for the modern social and economic policies influencing present-day governance and societal structures. To fully grasp the sci-fi films of 1932, it's necessary to take a brief look at the events shaping the collective human experience. And so, for the rest of this episode, I will focus on the world at large that played a role in influencing future filmmakers and storytellers. Amelia Earhart's Transatlantic Flight From May 20th to the 21st, aviation pioneer Amelia Earhart became the first woman and second person after Charles Lindbergh to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. The Bonus March In July, the Bonus Army, a group of unemployed World War I veterans, marched on Washington, D.C. to demand early payment of their military bonuses. The eviction of the Bonus Army's makeshift camps, ordered by President Hoover and carried out with military force, heightened tensions and drew public criticism for the government's response to the economic plight of veterans. Gandhi's Hunger Strike Beginning September 16th, Mahatma Gandhi embarked on a hunger strike in prison for six days to protest the British government's treatment of untouchables in India. The Election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt On November 18th, 1932, Franklin D. Roosevelt defeated Herbert Hoover to win the U.S. presidential election. He would go on to usher in the New Deal era as he sought to address the economic challenges of the Great Depression. He would take office in March 1933 and die in office on April 12, 1945, becoming the longest-serving U.S. president. The World Disarmament Conference in Geneva aimed to address global disarmament lasting from February to November. The conference ultimately failed to achieve its objectives, and global conflict was only a few years away with the start of World War II. The United States and the USSR did not attend, further eroding any hope of success. In the creative arts outside the film industry, we saw Picasso's Girl Before a Mirror. Pablo Picasso created the iconic painting Girl Before a Mirror in 1932 reaffirming that this multifaceted artist was one of the greatest of the 20th century. The Dresden War Triptych This powerful and haunting anti-war painting was created by German artist and World War I veteran Otto Dix between 1929 and 1932. The triptych vividly depicts the physical and psychological horrors of war, portraying the brutality suffering, and grotesque realities faced by soldiers on the front lines. His works would later be listed as degenerate art by the Nazi party in a few short years. Radio City Music Hall opened on December 27th. Radio City Music Hall, a renowned entertainment venue in New York City, opened its doors with a spectacular premiere that featured high-profile performances, precision stage shows, and the iconic Rockettes establishing it as one of the world's grandest theaters. And the scientific and technical advancements of the year include the discovery of the neutron. James Chadwick discovered the neutron, providing a crucial piece of information about the structure of the atomic nucleus. The BBC, while primarily a British broadcasting corporation, expanded its global reach through shortwave radio transmissions, 
enabling international audiences to access news, entertainment, and cultural programs from the United Kingdom. Also in 1932, John Logie Baird, the father of television, conducted experimental television broadcast on the network. Meanwhile, Radio Luxembourg conducted experiments involving high-powered, long-wave test transmissions aimed directly at the British Isles. These tests inadvertently resulted in the first radio modification of the ionosphere, contributing to advancements in understanding of radio wave transmission. Hollywood and the filmmaking industry were navigating the challenges of the Great Depression, which had a significant impact on the industry. The studio system was in full swing, with major studios such as MGM, Warner Brothers, and Paramount dominating the market. Despite economic hardships, Hollywood continued to produce a wide range of films, including musicals, gangster films, and screwball comedies, offering both escapism and social commentary to audiences. The introduction of sound in the late 1920s transformed filmmaking. There was a shift in filmmaking dominance from Europe during the silent era to Hollywood when talkies took over. And by 1932, Hollywood was firmly established as a global entertainment powerhouse, with the star system and genre specialization becoming prominent features of the cinematic landscape. However, that doesn't mean that the European film industry was dead. The first annual Venice Film Festival was held this year. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I discussed in the previous episode, was the first film screened. There were no official prizes, and audiences picked the winners, which included Dr. Jekyll, Anu La Liberté, and The Sins of Madeleine Claudet. While discussing science fiction films from 1932, it's essential to consider the broader context of the industry as a whole. And though this channel is about science fiction, I do want to highlight some notable non-sci-fi films and industry events of the year. In the United States, The Sign of the Cross was the highest grossing film of the year. The Cecil B. DeMille historical epic was known for its lavish production, depicting the decadence of ancient Rome and exploring themes of faith, morality, and persecution against the backdrop of the early Christian era. It made $2.7 million on a $700,000 budget. That $2.7 million is about $60 million today when adjusted for inflation. The year also saw the big screen debuts of Ingrid Bergman in Landskamp, Cary Grant in This Is The Night, Katherine Hepburn in A Bill of Divorcement, and Shirley Temple in The Red-Haired Alibi. Popular serials of the time were Tarzan the Tiger, starring Frank Merrill, The Last of the Mohicans, based on the popular novel by James Fenimore Cooper, and two serials starring John Wayne, The Shadow of the Eagle, and The Hurricane Express. MGM dominated the box office in 1932 with seven of the top ten films, including Grand Hotel and Tarzan the Ape Man. Some of the notable films of the year include Scarface. Director by Howard Hawks, this classic pre-code gangster film starred Paul Mooney, portraying the rise and fall of a ruthless and ambitious mobster in Prohibition-era Chicago. Murders in the Rue Morgue. Directed by Robert Flory, this horror mystery film is loosely based on the tale by Edgar Allan Poe, featuring Bella Lugosi as a mad scientist whose bizarre experiments in Paris lead to a series of gruesome murders. Dr. X. Directed by Michael Curtiz, this is a pre-code horror film following a newspaper reporter's investigation into a series of mysterious cannibalistic murders, uncovering a web of scientific experiments and dark secrets at a prestigious research institute. Horse Feathers, starring the Marx Brothers and directed by Norman Z. McLeod, is a classic screwball comedy set in the world of academia, where Groucho Marx becomes the president of Huxley College and hilariously navigates through football, romance, and absurdity. Vampire, 
Directed by Carl Theodore Dreyer. This landmark horror film is known for its surreal and atmospheric storytelling, following a young man's eerie encounters with the supernatural as he becomes entangled in a vampiric mystery. Grand Hotel, directed by Edmund Golding, the classic ensemble drama capturing the intersecting lives of diverse guests in a luxurious Berlin hotel, exploring themes of love, betrayal, and fate against the backdrop of the Great Depression. Shanghai Express Directed by Joseph von Sternberg and starring Marlena Dietrich and Clive Brook, this captivating drama is set against the backdrop of war-torn China, where a diverse group of passengers aboard a train grapple with love, intrigue, and personal conflicts. And finally, The Mummy. Directed by Karl Freund and featuring Boris Karloff, the classic horror film where an ancient Egyptian priest, Imhotep, is resurrected seeking love and immortality while unleashing a series of chilling events. Cinema of 1932 was best remembered for its comedies, horror, and melodrama. But sci-fi isn't down and out just yet. 1933 will bring a curious mix of subgenres, including the sci-fi horror and the return of the sci-fi musical. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for future videos about the history of science fiction cinema. I'm looking forward to getting into the films of this decade, the hidden gems, the serials, and those that blended genres.